Does anybody else ask prayer for? Oh my yes. It's like laugh. It's the worst. Definitely heal. I mean, you feel you. I was about 12, I think. But I just feel like I'm dying. I've never felt like that in my life. I didn't realize I had it. Yes. I had a high so, My hygiene is very, very important. We need to educate our parents on what? Throwing away that toothbrush. Yes. It's very, very important. I mean, yeah, you can't use that infected, that toothbrush is infected, and really they probably need to use what? Disposable cups and things like that, things that they can throw away for a while. Especially once you realize that they do have strep, right? Yeah. Warm saline gargles, it helps soothe, it's very nice. Cool liquids, maybe ice chips there a little bit. Cold or warm compresses, you probably can. Um, but the warm saline gargles, and a lot of people love that. Yeah, and cool things, you know. They don't want much to eat, right? Because even that infection just makes you feel a little nauseated, you know, things like that. And you have no desire to eat anything, and yeah, it's just terrible. So upper respiratory tract infections, I don't know if I need to say anything about tonsillitis. Masses of the lymph, um, lymphoid tissue located in the pharyngeal cavity. And so, yeah, some people do just come in with tonsillitis. So that's inflammation of the tonsils. And repetitive cases of, infl of tonsillitis leads to what? One possibly having a what? Tonsillectomy. Okay? So you got to understand if you, and I was telling another student yesterday, um, I took the medical terminology class, um, and it really helped me in, you know, being in, the, in nursing. You got to know your prefixes and suffixes of words, and so a lot of times you all are missing test questions because you don't understand what's in that scenario. So just be mindful of that. You know, itis just means inflammation, and then there's the it, agent. That's the organ. It's my tonsils. You know, that's where it is. And so right there tells me something, you know. Um, so it's swelling. Can obstruct the airway, so airway is a problem. Don't need it to obstruct the airway, you know? They pretty much mouth breathing. Um, we need to culture it, right? So persistent infections, pretty much three or more. And a lot of times the physicians just say, um, um, it's better to just go ahead on and take out the adenoids as well. It's better to. Some children just come just for a tongue selection and never have any more problems, you know? The adenoids and everything like that. <laughs> So have suction and oxygen at the bedside, but be mindful of what type of suctioning you're doing. And you're very, I've done minimal suctioning, just a little bit with that yonker, you know, in the oral mucosa, just a little bit. I mean, I'm very, very careful. Um, I'm not doing anything, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, I cause trauma there, right? Um, place them on that abdomen or side until they're fully awake. Discourage coughing, so maybe they will, you know. Number one, they're gonna come up, you know, from, Surgery, so they've had some type of, you know, anesthesia, some sedating medication. So uh, inspect their secretions. They could have a cold collar, and we may even give them an anti-emetic. Why? We don't want them to vomit. That's just popsicles. You said you don't want them to cough. You should, you don't want yeah, you want to discourage coughing. You know, maybe can cause some incisional bleeding. I mean, just to, yeah, really, it should be for the more so um, for the tonsillitis than just the tonsillitis. Huh? Probably. Well, um, generally, most surgeons won't do tonsillectomies until they're about at least two years of age. There is kind of like a yeah. Yeah, they don't really, yeah. For some, for some reason, they really don't have, start having really problems until they get to the tattoo older. But most of them will say three. You know, it just depends. But they won't do a one-year-old. I haven't seen a one-year-old have a consulate. They had to be pretty bad for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they won't, yeah, they won't do that. Yeah, they'd probably be a greater risk for a lot of other things, too. So, yeah. so assess for signs and symptoms of bleeding. We can't say that enough. You probably see this on ink legs. Frequent swallowing is the number one. Thing that would kind of alert the nurse to something is really odd. Oh, she's fighting a lot. Yeah, what's going on here? Yeah. Restlessness. May do some visual assessment. Just be careful in your visual assessment within your scope and all of that. Vomiting up blood. But how do I know that's blood? Because a lot of times when someone is vomiting up, I describe the emesis and the color. You can't really say that something is blood. You can say that it's red. You can say things like that. 
um, because you have to make sure and know that it is blood. It could be just something, I don't know, that somebody brought in a red popsicle you didn't know and that's what they ate, you know. So just be careful what you're documenting and how quickly you're doing that. Because uh, the um, physician is going to be upset with you as the nurse that, you know, yeah, that was just a popsicle. It's not blood. Why am I doing all of this, you know. Um, pallor, decreasing in blood pressure is a late sign. So assess for signs and symptoms of airway obstruction. They may have a lot of drooling. It may be very tachypnic and that striderous um, sound because of the occlusion of their of the airway and the edema and the uh, accumulated secretions. Everybody think you got tonsillectomy to care of it. You understand about tonsillitis. Other upper respiratory infections, influenza. One to three day incuba incubation, flu, common in the winter, but it's really carrying over to what? The spring. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, really, yeah. Even if somebody say um, someone's diagnosed in June, you know, and flu, and I'm like, really? Yeah. So, different strains, you know, uh, we are having. And so they're kind of saying that's kind of some of the reasons, like one vaccine covers this one, but it didn't cover that one, and things like that. How do we help, you know, make that better? I don't know. Um, so we have the distinct types A, B, A and B, which can cause epidemic disease, and type C, which is pretty much unimportant from an epidemiological um, standpoint. But we, um, I've never heard of really many deaths until like last year or the past couple years, especially a lot of our children dying and things like that. Like asthmatics, anybody who has a lung condition should probably already be vaccinated, you know? Unless there are some contraindications for some reason, because that probably can really kill them, you know, if it's not treated immediately, you know? <clears throat> so, to make sure um, that we understand that. What are complications? Encephalitis, pneumonia, then you can have some secondary bacterial infections, um, may even have to develop bacteremia, get to your bloodstream. So very, very compromising. So just based on that, that's what you see. Um, most of the asthmatics who got admitted last year, that's what they had, positive for flu, that asthma, led to pneumonia, and you know. And they were hospitalized for a while. And it was many in several different states that asthmatic children were hospitalized. Yeah. So otitis media, what do we know about that? Without treatment, they can tear them off. Well, it's no deeper in the middle ear, and then we can tear them off. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, most prevalent in early childhood can be preceded by a viral infection, malfunctioning of the eustachian tubes. Um, a lot of our um, infants begin having a lot of different ear infections as well because our parents are propping bottles, right? And the milk drains in the ear and causes major um, bacteria infections, um, repetitive you know, type of infections. Um, some babies you'll see, um, maybe six to eight months old, start having some type of upper respiratory problems. You can't really diagnose a child with asthma, you know, probably like less than two, um, but generally we see that a lot. Uh, we see a lot of um, those who have upper respiratory infections tend to have more um, otitis media, and then they may lead to having some type of asthma and development of things like that. So how do we treat that? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, and like she said, the major problem is that eventually untreated or repetitive um, otitis media can lead to major hearing loss. And so that's the big thing there. Sometimes we do need to do a hearing test. Um, you know, they do a hearing test on our newborn babies and things like that. But those who keep coming in for repetitive ear infections, the physician may do another one, you know, just to assess things there. And then we gotta make sure that mom is complying and she's giving the medication and antibiotic for appropriately and you know, as scheduled, because that's a lot of problems too. You know, they're non compliant, didn't even give the medicine and things like that. Um, sometimes they have to come in because of repetitive ear infection and have surgery. And what do they have done? Tubes. Have the bilateral myringotomy tubes. And they um, have those in for a while, what, about a year or two? Um, it depends on which ones they're seeing. Yeah. It, it depends on the um, type of, and then that's severe. That's for several, several times if the child just is not getting any better. Four, six months. Uh -huh. 
the Otis media is viral. Oh, Titus. Oh, Titus. If it's viral, then will we be treating the, the antibiotics before it? Okay. Okay. It's what proceed? It's preceded by viral infection. Like they can have like the upper respiratory runny nose, things like that. It's preceded, but it's bacterial. It's bacterial that stays there. Like the milk, you know, you know, you know the draining of the milk sits in there and bacteria growth, yeah, things like that. So kind of like showing some pictures there of the normal middle ear, no types of media. So all that's very, very important because you don't want, you know, a child to develop something that can affect them for the rest of their life just due to having repetitive, repetitive ear infections, right? Not to be having major hearing loss. And it can happen. So safety, caution, all that. So what are some of our croup syndromes? We're going to pretty much talk about acute laryngeal tracheal bronchitis, mainly. Um, maybe he touched the other ones just you know, here and there. Um, so what do they have, that resonant cough barking, right? Mm -hmm. There are degrees of respiratory distress. Sometimes we can treat that laryngeal tracheal bronchitis at home, right? Yep. What are some yep. things that they tell mom to do? What else? What else can she do non-pharmacologically? Humidified oxygen. Humidified oxygen. She can turn the hot water shower on, the hot water. And just sit in the bathroom. And I'm sitting there, steam. The steam helps. Um, and um, improve in that area because what is happening, we got inflammation in the bronchi, in the trachea, and the larynx, right? So all of that area is becomes what? Edema is swollen, and so that um, helps with that and makes it better. And um, the child has that stridorous, you know, cough, I mean, stridorous and fictitious breath sound that you hear just audibly as you walk in the room if they're in the hospital. Um, and they can just monitor them there and as she stated they may give them a, t a steroid to help with that inflammation as well um but if they're having to be admitted child probably just not wanting to drink much um maybe coming a little bit dehydrated and just it's just, just not getting any better and so they're admitted to the hospital a lot of times we put them in the crew mist tent that helps and they're just like in that continuously um sleep in the crib and the, and the mist tent is over the crib and things like that um, they may receive some type of aerosol treatment, racemic epinephrine, and so that helps with the stridor as well and it's done by the respiratory therapist. And really with that, it just depends on if they're just not wanting to drink, if we need to start an IV um, and give them intravenous fluids for a while. Depends on their respiratory status, the respiratory rate, or they to kidney, you know, things like that. Then we may not, but they may just be on limited clear liquids if they can. And so um, it's, it's where we can control it. Um, pretty much um, it's not unbearable um, for the mother. That noise, that sound, she might be complaining about that a whole lot and it might seem like it's more, it's worse than it really is. Um, then they may have the acute spasmodic laryngitis where they pretty much just have the midnight croupy cough, you know, 1 a.m. mom says about 3 a.m. and things like that. Um, and so she still, I would always encourage someone to bring their child in to be seen, you know, to, um, we understand bacterial tracheitis, um, you have the thick frothy, well not frothy, but thick greenish, yellowish foul odor coming from the tray, kind of tracheal infection, they're on intravenous antibiotics, they may have a central line, depending on that type patient who has the trait, you know, um, what type of underlying disease process caused them to have to receive a trait. Epiglottitis, the epiglottis, that inflammation, swollen, the tongue is protruding out of the mouth. They kind of like lean forward a lot to try to breathe in an orthopnic position. A lot of drooling there. Um, this is an emergent um, situation. Um, this child probably be placed close to the nursing station, um, but we're like not far from the intensive care unit. This is a child that the crash count cart is probably outside of the room. Um, everything is set up in the room, appropriately suctioning everything. Um, may have to intubate. We have intubated at the bedside due to that. Um, intravenous fluids, nothing by mouth. Int um, triple antibiotics to help take care of that. Um, if you catch it ahead of time, then you can probably treat it on the floor. But most of the time, they're having to be hospitalized. So, humidified oxygen just depends. And you see that one, that's like that infant there. But just imagine in a crib, and it's pretty much the whole crib is covered with them. 
It has a zipper to it. You can, you know, unzip it and try to get the child out of it, put them back in and things like that. And if you just want to feed, you just want to hold. Some parents get in the crib with them, you know, things like that to comfort them, to make them feel better, things like that. Monitor and respiratory status. These children, anybody, <laughs> anyone pretty much with a respiratory problem, things are being impaired, um, they should be on a continuous pulse oximeter. We know that that sensor can cause um, the skin kind of burns. So for our infants, we change that pulse ox sensor, you know, as needed, probably every two hours. Uh, we know that we place it on the nail bed, um, you place it on the pulse, you place it on the ear, you know, all that. You know the warm extremities um, are better. Readings, cool extremities give abnormal values. Make sure that anybody has oxygen on, that you make sure that it's connected properly before you go and run and say that the O2 sat is that. Make sure everything is connected all the way from the patient all the way back to the flow meter. Anything greater than two liters should have humidification because why? The oxygen drives the nares. May cause a little bit of bleeding, things like that. Go by your hospital pol policy though, but most of the time, anything you know, greater than two liters. Is the two liters for the, just the infants? Because um, it was four in adult. It may be four, li four liters for an adult, but if I was taking care of an adult, it would be two liters. Um, four liters is a lot of oxygen to infuse, and you'll even hear adults. Um, yeah, I've taken care of adults, and at least two liters, I get humidification. It begins to dry the near, and even the client pretty much will tell you. But it may be four liters for an adults, but I know for children, we do at least two liters um, pretty much. You don't see children on oxygen a lot. You don't see them on I would there you don't see them on it a lot. But and we give them fractions of oxygen. We get a flow meter with fractions on it. We start at the lowest increment for children. No anybody should start at the lowest increment. Nobody should start on two liters. Why you need two liters? You don't know what one liter does. You don't know what half a liter does. You don't know what eighth of a liter. So you always start at the lowest increment on the flow meter and then you increase as needed. So if you need to wean, you can quickly wean. That's the goal. It's not for anyone to ever just be on oxygen forever unless they have that disease process that we determine once they're admitted, you know, that they have to be on that. So how do we monitor the respiratory status? What things do we do? How do we monitor the respiratory status on the client? Watch their breathing. breathing. <laughs> we listen Watch to the airway, breathing. right? Listen for adventitious breath sounds. Everybody should know the sounds of all the different adventitious breath sounds and the disease processes they call them. Cause them. Pneumonia causes pretty much the crackles, ronk out, you know, rails, things like that. Asthma causes the wheezing. We've already talked about the croupy causes the strider. So you're supposed to be able to distinguish and kind of like know what you're listening to, right? And identify that that is an adventitious breath sound and what the treatment is for it. Talked about um, um, RSV, which we can't say bronchiolitis, most frequent cause of hospitalization in children less than one year old. But you could even see a two year old with RSV, you know, as well. And we kind of like covered it, I think, enough. Probably been around an older sibling who has a cold, their own contact isolation can be life threatening. They're hospitalized, what? Inadequate hydration tachypnea, apnea, <coughs> marked retractions. May not see it as much um, because some of the um, newborn babies that are born with different disease processes, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, other lung problems, they may already receive the RSV synergist, which kind of like the vaccination for the respiratory assistive virus because they would, it would probably kill them if they developed it. So, but it's very, very expensive and you have to meet the guidelines and the protocol in order to receive that. Everybody pretty much know how to set up a room and know what problems are going on pretty much for that. Said if the respiratory rate is greater than what? 60. 50 breaths per minute, 50. 30 to 60 is normal. But if it's greater than 50, most physicians would say hold on um, any, um, make them NPO and hold the feeds for now, because it's just gonna be an increase in work of breathing, right? They're gonna be leading to tachypnea and things like that. And so they're gonna be trying to suck and breathe, suck and breathe, that's terrible to see. Um, even on the heart babies, you'll see that um, where they're trying to eat, but yeah, due to the um, impairment of the heart functioning causes problems there. What is contact isolation? What do I put on as I enter the room? Gown and gloves. Gown and gloves. 
can put a mask on if I believe that, you know, it's going to be, if it's going to be coughing and spraying, you know, secretions, I can, but that's not with in contact isolation precautions. So just make sure you um, um, know that and that you educate your, 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 your um, family members and things like that. And we all do always take off our um, protective uh, gear inside the room. It should be an ante room attached to that contact, uh, to that, that room, and you take it off there and never in the hallway. And they do proper hand washing and things like that. Uh, limit visitors. Children probably should not visit, but they do, you know. But if they we try to educate them and tell them, but well, we can't really stop them, you know. But they do, um, especially an infant, you know, another infant don't need to come in there because <coughs> they'll probably end up having it and be hospitalized as well. They may or may not be on that bronchodilator, it just depends uh, based on the position, right? If they're wheezing. A lot of physicians do everything. We do everything on infants, children, less than six months to a year of age, you know, come in with a fever and respiratory distress and things like that. They're probably doing a chest x-ray, spinal tap maybe, you know, things like that. May have 100.5, you know, temperature, things like that. We do blood cultures. We do everything because our main thing is to rule out everything, you know, as much as we possibly can. And all of those things will tell us most, most things there. Because uh, the infant coming in with 100.5 could have meningitis. We don't know. Um, so... A lot of times we do spinal tap, all of that, you know. Um, if you look at the spinal fluid, pretty much um, as a physician is doing the spinal tap, it's pretty much thick and cloudy, um, thin and clear. It's pretty much um, not any type of bacteria or meningitis present. So we do all of that, um, keeping the head of the bed elevated, knowing to do that, or let mom hold the child and things like that. Yeah. Um, tell mom to be cautious with feeding, you know, when the child is in this situation with secretions and you know, that drainage, you know, and all that can cause them to choke. Um, you know, they might think that they're not getting the proper nutrition. So sometimes it's why the physicians will go ahead and put them on intravenous fluids as well. So education is very, very important in, um, for the parents to know and all of that. Asthma probably won't say much about, but chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways, most chronic disorder of childhood on the rise. Um, <clears throat> I have to kind of distinguish and say, does the child have allergies that cause them to have, you know, symptoms related to an asthmatic? Um, physicians have said that has occurred, and um, but I still have to diagnose them with asthma. But what we have learned that with our parents, if we educate and we tell them those things that are causing the allergens, um, you know, dog hair, carpet. Um, sometimes cold weather, high altitude, um, rainy weather um, makes um, children with asthma, you know, begin to wheeze and have problems with distress. And so once they re eliminate or reduce the number of allergens, we see our children improve. A lot of children are on singular. They have an inhaler. Um, as they get a little bit older, mid, you know, eight, nine, they, they can understand how to use an inhaler. They may not have to take the albuterol, Zofanex, you know. Um, they still probably have the nebulizer at home and things like that, but they kind of grow out of that, you know. Um, and really, if you kind of like really decrease the number of allergens, then you really see the child really doing well. Um, yeah, not around the stuffed animals and things like that, you know. Sometimes children may visit this person, every time they come back there, you know. Uh, wheezing and in distress and things like that, and you sent them, you know, and they were fine, but yeah, so have to educate everybody who's the caregiver for that child. Cystic fibrosis, inherited autosomal receptive trait. We said that um, that increased viscosity of mucous gland secretions. The um, area within the lungs is very, very fibrotic. But we have that increase, <coughs> fibrotic, I think I said it. We do have an increase of viscosity. Um, within the intestines, within the pancreas area, right? We have absence of that pancreatic enzyme. So we have to take the pancreatic, the pancreas um, capsules daily, right? Uh, with our meals um, to help for better digestion. Um, we're, they're very, very malnourished. So they're pretty much on a high calorie, high protein diet. Um, we let them mom bring things from home and things like that. Not a restricted diet. They're generally on a regular diet but they need to increase in calories. And you'll still see, no matter how much they're eating, you know, the supplemental tube feedings at night and things like that, they're still not really gaining weight appropriately um, there. They receive the chest physiotherapy, the aerosol treatments, um, just pretty much around the clock, 
based on the severity. <coughs> some will just come in sometimes you'll just say for a workup. They're going on a trip and they just come in and get treatments, you know, things like that. And then a lot of them have pneumonia a lot, and so they're in the hospital for that. And usually we say drop the precautions, but most of the time we put our cystic fibrosis on strict reverse, on meaning that we don't want to give them anything. And as I stressed again, you wouldn't be able to care for them, you know, if you're ill of a respiratory infection and things like that. You just have another patient. You know, it's generally the thing that we try to do based on the you know, census for the um, for the day, every time we can. But most parents, they're adamant, they have a tablet, they record everything, and you won't be taking care of their child, you know? So, and you can kind of understand that, because you can really give them a setback, you can cause them to be in a little bit longer, and all of that. So, asthma is a viral respiratory infection, may have a significant role. As we said, those allergens that are triggers, you know, take care of them, educate, you know, hopefully the parents will, you know, abide by what you're really teaching them and then they'll kind of see because you definitely don't want to see a child that's coming in and they just barely can breathe you know and you see the distress that they're in you know you know glossy eyed and they're just you know really just yeah they need air they need air restriction restriction to the bronchos um stenosis stenosis that's causing the wheezing and so it's pretty terrible and so most of the time if mom has been trying to give those treatments every two hours you know we tell them once they become sick, every four hours probably, um, if they're not ill, but every two hours, and don't, they don't improve, they need to be brought to the emergency room to be seen. Then there, we're gonna try to give them some type of aerialization, you know, before we start anything else, because we're hoping we can send them home. But generally, they fail the test, and so they can't, and they have to be admitted. So then now they need a steroid, they need solumedrol, intravenously. And so they get a loading dose of that, and then they get it like every six hours, around the clock. May or may not be on intravenous fluids, it just depends. Um, aerosol treatments. Um, we do a chest x-ray. A lot of times, most asthmatics, I don't know, it just seems like they develop pneumonia very quickly. And so now they may be on some type of antibiotic. Could be oral, could be intravenous. So we just want to care for them, you know, as much as we possibly can. And teach, teach, teach. So it may have a happy, non-productive, um, cough that becomes rattling. Um, that may be how it begins, but then it may become productive. And you know that pneumonia has set in then. Shortness of breath, wheezing, their lips are pretty much deep and dark red, sweating, um, almost in that orthopnic position, you know, posture hunched over, just trying to breathe, you know. I mean, leaning over, they kind of like, you know, give me a little bit of chest expansion and helps them breathe a little bit more. Um, very apprehensive. And we know restlessness is an um, early sign of what? Hypoxemia, <laughs> decrease in level of consciousness. So they're getting ready to crash, right? Um, and you don't want that to happen. And you gotta intubate, you know, all that. Don't want it, you know, you should not. We should be able to care for asthmatics, you know, in a manner where we can prevent that. But, you know, some asthmatics really are, too, you know, they're really, 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 really um, have some bad, um, some really terrible things going on. And it's just really no matter what the doctor is doing, it's, you know, he tries to be aggressive as much as possible. And, you know, sometimes it just does not work. And, um, yeah. But overall, if the parents are compliant and then as the children get older and they're compliant, <laughs> things generally work out okay. We're not having major problems, you know. There. Um, but that bronchospasm, you know, can really kill someone immediately. <coughs> so prevention, reduction of allergies and illness, we're, uh, recognize the early signs and symptoms of bronchospasms. You know, um, respiratory therapists come in and do the peak flow, um, tidal volume, things like that. Um, they really are the ones who educate and teach them on how to use the inhaler. And so that's another thing too. You know, that's why it, it depends on your developmental level and how you understand, because it's a certain way. And when you inhale, you should press and then, yeah. And so ch some children aren't, so they're not really receiving the medication they should. We should make sure at school that they have everything that they need. Mom can bring the medication, school nurse can, you know, administer it, you know. They should always try to use the inhaler before physical activity, right? Um, and then whatever their schedule is, you know, that they do. Um, chest physiotherapy. We can even teach mom how to cuff a hand and, you know, um, do chest physiotherapy. You know. 
Um, they have devices, they have machines, you know, and things like that. But it's some things that they can do at home as well to help as much as possible. <clears throat> Cystic fibrosis, um, we talk about the abnormal mucus secretion, small intestine, pancreatic ducts, bile ducts, and the bronchi. So if they have bile ducts with pancreas, they have that um, those fatty um, stools, they call that stearia. And they have it in the um, small intestines as well, and the bronchi. So that's why you say copious, copious amounts, copious amounts. And it's thick, thick, frothy, thick, thick, frothy, greenish yellow. It's a foul odor <clears throat> most of the time, you know, even when they don't have pneumonia. It's a foul odor. And they try to expect a rape, you know, as much as they possibly can um, there. So we said that elevating um, sodium is um, chloride, salty baby, do that sweat test on them. One spec positive, um, sodium level 60 milligrams per deciliter or greater, pretty much indicative of cystic fibrosis. Um, they have frequent respiratory infections. Um, they do the diagnostic tests uh, where they have the, they do the sweat test and they identify that there's absence of pancreatic enzymes. So I take these orally to um, help with that. And they may or may not be born with um, a meconium ileus at birth. <coughs> so the foul smelling bulky stools um, are stearia. And they tend to have, be hyperglycemic. Uh, may have a prolapsed rectum and they're very, very malnourished. Increase in work or breathing, you know, burning the calories off all the time, and so yeah. So we have to give them their high calorie, high protein diet. Pancreatic enzymes are swollen whole, do not chew, 30 minutes before meals. High protein, high calorie. We want to give them those water miscible vitamins as well, A, D, E, and K. Um, it just depends. We monitor their blood glucose level. You kind of see this hyperglycemia more with the adolescents. We monitor their blood glucose level, and then sometimes they are treated as a type 2 diabetic, but it just depends. It, it, sometimes it's not all the time that they are hyperglycemic. Um, it may be just occasional, so it just depends. With the physician, doing it, yeah, monitor it, and maybe do a hemoglobin A1C and do some other definitive test, you know, before we, uh, because that's not something that they kind of like, you know, they don't need anything else to add on, you know, to the list. Um, just that cystic fibrosis is really enough. Um, now, don't want to say much here, but this was one, um, I've taken care of a few patients with that bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, where the lung is just displaced um, in adequate shape of the lung. All major problems um, with breathing and things like that. Um, a lot of them have traits, a lot of them on the ventilator. Prognosis is poor. Um, if they live to about a year of age, you know, it's great. Um, some may even just a tad bit longer. Hi. Sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. You're fine. I remind my clinical groups to come to section 102 to sign your evaluations. Sorry, Oh, you're fine, Ms. Um, Did y'all hear? Uh, y'all didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not going to say much there. Um, but they may have some kidney retractions, nasal flaring, same symptoms there. Um, longevity is very, very poor. Um, they're very expensive because they're in the hospital pretty much most of their life if they get to go home but it's rare because um, longevity is very poor. Very, very chronic lung disease, very, very chronic. Surfactant deficiency, but now, I taught it last semester, when well, that was fall, uh, one person had a child that was born with this and he's doing well. He's about five or six. And so I was like, wow, you know. So I don't know if she, if, you know, it was, I don't know, but generally, the um, longevity is very, very poor, and he is doing great, and really is not showing any signs and symptoms of any major, you know, lung problems. Sudden infant death syndrome, we said, well, how do we prevent that? Back to sleep, right? Um, and many other things, safe crib, and just keeping things out of the crib, and educating, educating, educating mom, um, 
about things that can be genetic predisposition, uh, maternal smoking during pregnancy, um, and prone sleeping. You know, um, they're saying that that pretty much, you know, is indicative of you know one, but not much. Still not still doing a whole lot of research on for those who have died of SIDS. Um, not getting any, any factual information right. of just really, really what causes it. it. Yeah. So they're still spending thousands of dollars, you know. But back to sleep is helping, you know. I'm thinking it is improving and helping a whole lot there. So medications, kind of like have covered most of them. Um, avoid aspirin to any child unless approved. Prevent rise syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Antihistamines. Um, adverse effects, they may have blurred vision, urinary, um, retention, dry mouth, um, may have decongestants, can cause increase in the heart rate, so I want to tell mom, dad, may give some mucolytics, to help what, thin that, those secretions, when they can cough it up, expect the rate. Um, mucus mist, sometimes they might give that with a, a treatment, it's just uh, very, very, it smells like an egg almost, yeah. Yeah. but it works. Give them cystic fibrosis patients for treatments and things like that. May give some antitussives. Let's say about that antiviral. You see Tamiflu given all the time, right, for the flu? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I hear anybody say that they get great effects for them or not, because it's really just viral. But maybe it helps some, but it's viral, so. Um, yeah. you know, but. So, um, the flu is viral, medication is antiviral, but the doctor said really, you know, rest, fluids, things like that. The main thing is try to get the vaccine. That's the really the biggie. And a lot of people don't, and that's okay too, but you know, the ramifications and the uh, major side effects, complications from it is really terrible. Um, and they just say, even if you feel like, you know, you just had an aches and, you know, chills, <laughs> You know that's great because you still don't want the full you don't want the full aspect of the flu virus because it may not be where you can tolerate it. So theophyll can be used by physician, asthmatics, cystic fibrosis, the leukotriene modifiers as we say a singular. I take a tablet once a day. School age, you know, older children, you know, and probably even maybe six, seven, you know, but the mom can give it to them, you know. Tastes pretty good. I guess so. Um, Nice flavored tablet, thank you. So, um, probably in sodium, intol, they may give that as an um, aerosol treatment as well. And then we have our corticosteroids, intranasally. Some people may be on the nasal cord, flow nase, asthmatics. Could even give it to somebody who had no pneumonia, you know, things like that. And we see Advair still for our asthmatics, or the beta agonists, and ProVental. Um, Another provincial, a lot of our nebulizers cause tachycardia. And so we want to just, you know, alert the mother. Yeah, it will. Child may be very, very active for a little while. And so if they get into treatments like every four hours, you'll just see that for a while. They're very, very anxious there. Wait. Let's see what we can talk about hydration really quickly. May not finish it. I mean, it's not that much though. Um, can you tell me about hydration? <coughs> Hydration, patient comes in, dehydrated, how do they present? They're going to be weak, tired. How do they appear? What's your assessment? Are you assessing the dehydrated patient? Five months old. What else is sunken? Fontanelle. Fontanelle is sunken. Lack of tearing. Dry mucosa. Dry lips. Skin turg is poor. What else? Color is weird. Have a little pallor there. Do they have modeling on Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Um, maybe a little bit. Um, what else? Rocky memory. Does their heart rate be up? May have a little tech of car, you're very good. What else? Capillary refill is good. may be greater than three seconds. Um, your specific gravity. Your specific gravity is what? Right. What somebody said something about the your specific gravity? You think you might need to know that? Yes. yes. 
Should be greater than what? 1.001. Less than 1.02. 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 Try to do a urinalysis on them, right? Yeah. How the urine probably look? Dark. Concentrated. Dark. Um, my probably said they haven't been keeping anything down. Mom did diarrhea. Um, so it may say urine for a UA in culture. Could draw some blood, right? What kind of what would I draw blood for? CDC. 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 Or CMP. Definitely look at them electrolytes, right? How would the electrolytes look? They pretty much low, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what can we do there um, to kind of like, if we have it to admit them to the hospital, replace their um, um, IV fluids? IV fluids. What kind of IV fluids? Mm -hmm. Lactate ringers. Gonna put the uh, put what in it? What else we gonna put? Not dextrose. Potassium. When you add additives to fluids, especially potassium, what do you have to check first? What else? Kidneys, very good. Kidney functioning, right? So the child has to void before it. The doctor probably write it as an order like that. Must void before you add the 20 ml of potassium chloride to the fluid. Strict intake and output. I've weighed them naked, right? I have the chart with their weight on it and highlight it. And on the back of that chart, you usually have all emergency rescue drugs and the dosages that I can give them just in case things happen there. Um, mm -hmm. What do we say about the water balance in infants? 75%. 75%, so it predisposes them to what? Dehydration. Um, so how are we gonna, we're gonna, how do I know, or how will I, say he's five months old, how do I know he has adequate urine output? Weigh the diaper. So I, I weigh. I have the weight of the dry diaper, right? Mm -hmm. Then I weigh the child's diaper, the infant's diaper, and I subtract the difference. Mm -hmm. And so one gram is equal to one milliliter. The scale is in grams, so one gram is equal to one mL. So I convert it. Um, Mom said he had um, an ounce of um, formula at home prior in the car prior to coming here, but he vomited. So one ounce is equivalent to how much? 30 ml. Do everything in mLs. 30, 30, 30 mLs. 30 mLs. So I have to record that, document that, and we tell her to leave the bottles on the table. You may want to just give him a little Pedialyte right now <coughs> and just see how he's doing. He may be made nothing by mouth, right, because he's been vomiting so much. Explain to her that no, I mean he could lose a little bit of weight, you know, for the time period that he's not receiving nutrition, but not drastically, and he's been hydrated intravenously. And so once the vomiting subsides, and we find the etiology of possibly why the vomiting is occurring, then we will, um, you know, we can proceed there because we could treat right the vomiting. What's one reason that the five-month-old could be vomiting? Pyloric five-month-old. Pyloric stenosis is very good. What is pyloric stenosis? It's a, it's a stenosis of the little bit of muscle. Yeah, part of the stomach. It's stenosis, and so they're trying to make a drink, swallows. Um, they have projectile vomiting. Vomit, right? They have projectile vomiting. What's projectile vomiting? <laughs> all right, all the way to um, um, Victoria. Yeah. Um, it's just that, yeah, it's just like that. Um, what do they say that when they're assessing um, and um, doing an abdominal assessment, what are the, does it feel like? Describe it. Olive shaped mass. That's a good NCLEX question, right? Olive shaped mass upon palpation. And so um, we probably will have to do what? How do we? Surgery. Surgery. Ultrasound is good. Well, um, is it ultrasound? I thought that's how you find it. Um, okay, abdominal ultrasound. Well, pylorus ultrasound. The funniest thing was, not the funniest, but <laughs> the strangest thing was, and one of our great surgeons who expired, but um, the mother, they were adamant, it was so upset because the child had been ill, vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. And so the doctor was just saying a virus, you know, blah, blah, this and that. Finally came to the hospital. Time this surgeon saw the baby. He said, well, let me just do a pylorus ultrasound. So, had, had um, pyloric stenosis. Um, 
that doctor was checking for upper GI problems, you know, gastric reflux and things like that. And that child was really kind of like failure to thrive by the mm -hmm. time they came to the hospital, had lost a lot of weight. And so time they did the pylormyotomy, which we'll talk about with ingestion, um, opening into, so the, the muscle is, is stenosing and narrowing, tightening, so they need to open it up. So now if they can flow properly, right, on digestion and everything, he did fine. So that's good. So just, that was just extra for GI, but um, we'll get there. So fluid requirements, this right here is what the pediatrician does. He calculates the weight of the child in kilograms, and then this is what he will allow. This is considered to be the daily maintenance fluid. Um, not that you need to know it, but we would like for you to review it, but the physician does this here. He allows 100, 100 mLs per kg for the first 10 kilograms, 50 mLs per kg for the second 10 um, kilograms, and then 20 for the remainder of the weight in kilograms. And this is, and then he takes that total amount after he gets that calculation and divide it by 24 hours. And then that determines his IV fluid rate. And so that's his maintenance fluid. So you see how important weight and all of that means when you come, it means a lot all the time for any client, but you really see here, because you can cause major problems. You can cause major um, problems with the calculation of a dosage for um, a medication, for chemotherapy, for whatever case. You can mess it up pretty badly just by inadequate weight. So as a nurse, you're monitoring the care tech or whomever, because all the time you're not weighing the client, but you should you know, be conscientious and have some idea of what is going on, all right? Should you know this chart, you should be familiar with it. Alterations that indicate dehydration. I need to know mild, moderate, and severe. And I need to know kind of like what I need to do. I mean, I'm not saying just know exactly everything, but you should be well aware of things that are going on there. So if there's a weight loss, it may be three to five percent, but it may be greater than or equal to 10 percent for a severe. Um, with the severe, they're um, hyper irritable to lethargic, um, absent or sunken eyes, orthostatic to shock. Um, they have a 10 percent weight loss in children, in hypernia, an increase in their breathing. Um, then you see moderate. It, you know, normal to sunken, so they may not have a sunken fontanelle, but they could. But they definitely have one with severe. So I think you can distinguish what's going on. As Ms. Creel said, the um, capillary refill greater than four seconds, and tinting, and skin is cool, and they ate, um, ate acrocyanotic, and they may have some modeling with severe. So you gotta know the difference. You all already identified the urine-specific gravity, uh, mild is less than 1.020, and it's greater than. I mean, it's less. I mean, it's greater than 1.020 and greater than 1.020. But here, we act, may, actually may not be able to assess as much because what is oligouria and anuria? Not right? not Minimal um, urine output and anuria absence of. So we may not even be able to assess or you know check the uh, urine specific gravity. You see the blood pressure parameters. You see what's kind of the mucous membranes. Molly, you know, we treat that at home with Pedialyte, right? Um, normal, um, moderate, dry, but as severe is parched. So the severe patient, even maybe the moderate, both, both, of, them, both of those probably will be hospitalized, but definitely the severe, right? All right, so um, pretty much identified um, the, the signs and um, symptoms of dehydration. Uh, strict, strict intake and output is so very important um, that you record, that you weigh everything. If the diaper has stool in it, then I identify that it has a urine and stool, and then I put those, you know, emails there. My vital signs are very, very important. Probably every four hours I'm taking vital signs on this client. I need to, right? Assess the skin, the mucous membranes. We're weighing them probably every night sh at nighttime, night shift assessing the fontanelles, but on, upon admission, we're doing all of this, and their are sensory alterations. So we can treat them with the Pedialyte, and rehydrate them at home, right? Mild. So rehydration solution should consist of 75 milliequivalents of sodium per liter. Um, we can give 50 to 100 milliliters per kg of oral rehydration solution over three to four hours for mild to moderate dehydration. And everybody see what that says? That says for mild to moderate dehydration. You can do it in what? Syringes. You can do it in a teaspoon. 
Uh, one teaspoon every five to ten minutes or by spoon and or syringe. Just be careful with the syringe, you know, how you're inserting it in the mouth and things like that. Um, you get the flavor, you know, Pedialyte, you can do that. You get the Pedi Pops, they have those, so you can just let those melt and you can do those as well. Um, so replacement and maintenance solution should consist of 40 to 60 milliequivalents of sodium per liter. And we say with our older kids, we're going to give them Gatorade. <laughs> and with our um, infants, um, pre well, infants, preschoolers, possibly. Can you explain that? Because that first sentence says it should consist of 75, and now it says 40 to 60. So what's the rehydration solution? Um, and this is per liter up there. Um, consists of 75 milliequivalents of sodium, just to mm -hmm. increase the um, electrolytes there. And then here is your replacement and maintenance. So here is kind of like, you know, it's all your Once you've got them so far. Dose, you know, yeah. initially first. So this is just the amount that right. we'll prepare initially. But then throughout, it should at least have, at least have 40 to 60, the maintenance. Okay, so like the initial is the 75. Right. Mm -hmm. and right. Okay. right. Mm -hmm. um, we want to replace fluid losses from vomiting and diarrhea on an ongoing basis. That's probably... In the calculation for the daily maintenance that the physician is doing, based on your what you've recorded and put in the strict intake and output, he's looking at all of that, you know, um, as much as possible. Um, we may even give some antiemetic, you know, for continuous continuous vomiting. We maybe would, but for a an infant, you know, it's just you know minimal that you will really be trying to give a, a minimal dosage or whatever. I've never really had to treat an infant for vomiting. Um, with an intravenous finagrin or anything like that. We just try our best to, um, um, maybe it's viral, you know, gastroenteritis, and, you know, hopefully with the hydration and the rest and things like that, they'll just improve over a period of time, and it gets better. It generally does get better. Now, rotavirus, you know, that's pretty bad um, that they could possibly have, and it may take a longer period of time and things like that. But, um, and they do stool studies on that. Um, so you may see where it lingers, but as long as this patient couldn't survive at home well, but as long as they're in a hospital, they'll be okay and you can stabilize them with the intravenous fluids and you can still be nothing but mouth. See what I'm saying? So what do we know about overhydration? It could be dangerous. It's Say it again. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, CHF. Okay, cause the crackles, right? Demons area. High blood pressure. So everybody know about all that. All right. Not gonna say much about this. Yeah. Yeah. What do y'all say? It's lunch. It's lunchtime. Okay. Almost done. Um. So everybody pretty much know about the electrolyte imbalances and the physiological changes, behavioral changes. Um, may have some fluid restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. And we could have some sodium restrictions. Um, and we may have to give some diuretics, but we'll probably see that more so in excretion, right? And with our um, nephrotic syndrome and things like that. I think five questions, you know, just knowing how to assess a dehydrated client that will um, Take care of the point there. Let's take you all have that one. Yep. All right. Um, so